Bueno, continuamos eh, la sesión de, las sesiones de, de esta mañana dedicadas a, a los tres artistas que, que han propuesto un, un taller para las jornadas y presentaros ahora a Kotjo Esun. Eh, eh, Kotjo Esun es artista y teórico que reside en Londres y, como muchos sabréis, es cofundador del colectivo de Otolit Group. El, eh, de Otolit Group ha expuesto en numerosas exposiciones internacionales y también en exposiciones individuales, obviamente, y bueno, mencionar algunas de las más recientes que, que han sucedido en Casco, eh, Oficina de Arte y Diseño y Teoría, pero también en Museo Ter Serralves y en Bergen Kunsthal, entre otros. ¿no? Eh, ya centrándonos más en, en Kotjo, eh, comentar que es, eh, que es escritor, también es autor de numerosos textos y, y libros, entre ellos ha, edit, ha escrito el libro Dan Graham Rock My Religion en el 2012 y también eh, el libro More Brilliant Than a Sun, Adventures in Sonic Fiction, eh, escrito en 1998. Eh, ha trabajado también como editor, como coeditor, en concreto del número de la revista Third Text, de, del número 108, dedicado a, a la imagen militante. El título de ese número era The Militant Image, a Cine, eh, a cine Geography. Eh, y, mmm, también comentar que, aparte de su práctica artística y su práctica como escritor, también es docente y tiene una labor docente, en concreto en el Departamento de Culturas Visuales de Goldsmith College y también trabaja en estos momentos como investigador invitado en el programa de máster de la Universidad de Arte y Diseño de, de Ginebra. Eh, Deciros, por último, el título de su, de su conferencia es la escena final de Hienas, una incorporación parentética. Y con esto os dejo con, con él. Thank you very much, Kocho. Um, thank you very much, Lara. Everybody hear me? No. Okay, good. Can everybody hear me now? Okay. Um, well, of course, I'd like to thank Lara for this invitation. Um, And I'd like to thank all of the team here in Mostelez, um, Alvarado, uh, Pablo, um, all the people who've put up with many months of emails and prevarication. Um, I'd like to thank all of you for coming out uh, on a, a boiling hot afternoon to uh, hear me talk. Um, I've enjoyed many of the talks of the last few days. I've learned a lot. I was last here, I think, seven years ago. and. Uh, I have many good memories of that time, so it's been a pleasure to be here. So I'm going to give a talk, which I've given a number of times, but uh, I adapted each time. And um, uh, it's a work in progress, so uh, it's very much um, uh, scaffolding towards uh, a future book, um, which examines um, the, the formulation of what um, over the last 20 years or so has been called Afrofuturism, which is uh, the kind of cultural movement that formed in uh, the US and the UK um, around questions of um, uh, mutation, uh, synthesis, alienation, abstraction, extraterritoriality, the relations between the non-human, the post-human, and the inhuman as they relate to questions of becoming in relation to the questions of African diasporicity, uh, the continent, uh, and the relation to life after slavery, and the making of the uh, African subject under conditions of racial capitalism. So it's a broad movement, um, but this talk comes out of um, Uh, a new project which uh, returns to the project of Afrofuturism, but rethinks it. So I'm going to just start. So in the last decade, the last 10 years or so, um, the artists and critics situated within the continent have pointed out that the Afro in Afrofuturism takes little or no account of the invention of African futures so that the Afrofuturism that was formulated during the 1990s in 
the UK, the US, the Caribbean, Europe, is a project really developed by and for Afro-diasporic practitioners. So this broad project, uh, I'm going to orientate around two readings of a particular film called um, Hyenas from 1992. And uh, Hyenas helps me to formulate a specific argument, which is that um, in many parts of the continent, in Nairobi, in Johannesburg, in Cape Town, in Lagos, in Kinshasa, many critics, many artists now argue that Afrofuturism is Americocentric. It's America-centered. It's Anglo-centric. It's too British. And this is inscribed within its founding moment in the early 90s. So there is a, an argument, should new critics and theorists and artists, should they redirect Afrofuturism towards taking account of the cultural production of African futures? That's to say the invention of literature, of music, of theory that is produced within the continent? Or should they replace the name altogether and come up with a new term that is capable of grasping the scale and the scope of futurities that are being imagined and invented in the continent now, in the present of a planet whose future extinction can be forecast with ever greater certainty. So there is a demand if you travel to these different cities and you meet artists and theorists and critics in Kinshasa, in Lagos, in Cape Town, in Johannesburg. There is a desire uh, for the new. There is a common task of inventing African futures. And this confronts contemporary artists and theorists as a present and urgent task. And this urgency, which is articulated in literature, in music, in video, in animation, in virtual reality, more or less concedes that there have been no African futurisms, no African science fictions, no African speculations, no African inventions to speak of until now. So there is a painful awareness of this gap between what has happened in America and Britain, uh, the, the work around uh, Sun Ra, the work around Lee Perry, the work around George Clinton, around the novels of Samuel R. Delaney, the novels of Octavia Butler. There is a painful awareness that all of the cultural practice and cultural theory, artistic innovation that has taken place in the diaspora uh, exists in a, in a kind of gap between the diaspora and the continent as if the diaspora is far ahead and practitioners in the continent have to catch up. And this feeling of having to catch up gives the generational present uh, an urgency. But it also inscribes a belatedness into cultural practices. It is as if the current generation has overlooked the cultural practices that have already been produced inside and outside of the continent. It is as if they are deaf and mute and blind to the range of continental fictions, fabulations, forms and forces that have been invented and imagined and intervened. So uh, the recent talks I've been giving under the name of the Continental Futures series is not so much to invent a new term, African futures or African science fictions, but it is to turn towards works that have been overlooked, works that have been under-theorized, works that have been unacknowledged. Uh, it is to examine projects that were already uh, futuristic before Afrofuturism even had a name, before Afrofuturism was even formulated in 1993 by the American critic Mark Derry, but of course going much further, in fact, throughout the 20th century. So, the idea is that certain projects, certain practices, certain writings and musics have been occluded and overshadowed by Afrofuturism. And in the present, we can return to these moments and revisit them in a new way. 
And so it is this imperative to return to certain overlooked art forms that allows us to revisit this film, Hyenas. Hyenas, which was directed by the Senegalese film director, Jibril Diop Mambetti in 1992. It was his second and final film. Uh, he died in 1998. So revisiting Hyenas, which is what I will do today, and in fact revisiting its final scene means to return to Hyenas, which we can understand as a cinema of demoralization. So in 1992, Hyenas was both celebrated and criticized for its aesthetic disenchantment of community and of morality that were understood to be specific to the continent. But what if we understand Hyenas aesthetic of disenchantment to be directed not only to the present of 1992, but also to be aimed at the future, to be aimed at what community and morality would become. So can hyenas be understood not only as a satire on greed, but as a work that seeks to anticipate in order to undermine the horizon of expectations that would look forward to the next decade of the continent. Can we see hyenas as a work that prefiguratively disenchants the exuberance of the economic forecasts for the continent of Africa that were projected for the second decade of the 21st century? From our point in 2016, we can look back at hyenas forward-looking disillusionment of a future in which Africa is supposed to be rising. A future that is enacted in the final scene of hyenas, a future that anticipates the present. Um, so in order to, to sketch these out in more detail, uh, can we play uh, the first clip of hyenas? Thank you. So it's about eight minutes. Neru Kolaban, Mboku Kolaban, Mbekte Murey Mingen Andal Tey, Kontan Nati Lol, Manglen Tey Grum. Wayanep, Waktan Wak Degasela, Samak Ndaw, Defa Wute, Lumeru Kolaban Netteli. Madame <laughs> Tribunal <laughs> Quand on est président tribunal, ça m'a dit un accueil. Amna Fanmeriat, à tout top. Madame Atifi, Chikolobal. Jogef, Tabi Saraba. Fofulama, Linger Ramatou, Mi Tok Fitei. Wallou. Manek Surgam, Bateji. Yaksel Gana. Gana Yaksel Tindelmi. 
Niko sohna si waxe dina len jox temeri milliards ci kaw ci kaw ngeen raxas turam ba mu set wetch 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 drama drama ñu ngi ñaan nga jégué ci man lu xew lu xew ci sama ciuru njité tribunal koloban ma waron atté mbirum li ngir ramatu mi tokté mu ngi won ci fukki atam ak juroom ñaa bama la woyé dang ma andil ñaari sédé lolu débele wessuno raman dramé ñi xawma len musumu len gis 1945 ma don atté fi ci koloban mbirum li ngir ramatu mu ndaw draman dramé sa ñaari sédé ngi lu ngeen waton ci kanamu tribunal bi ñu ñi ñoo waxone ñoo tedé li ngir ramatu ngeen wat ko ci kanamu tribunal bi wat ko ci kanamu ki ñu bind mba lolu mba lolu deug la won deug des ay fenn kessa la won dara du ci deug dara du ci deug wax len nak legi lu len li ngeer def soxna si dafa yone ñu war ñu ba gis ñu lu mu len def lu mu len def li ngeer li ngeer ramatu def ñu bolek ay borom bax nañu ñuul waaw waaw ñu japp ñu yo bu ñu penku tapp ñu def ñu ay jigen ba tax ñu melni mbir ma ngok li ngeer non la deme atté bobu jeex na Mama neexul legi nak jënda na ko téméri milliard kuma rayal drama drama mi taxaw ma fay la ñëgëm ramatu li lolu bu def lolu ni ma fatalu ko demb bi ma dan ndax nak yi fatawu ma dara nak nak la ban ci ma xol ba tay fatawu ma ci ñum bëggel fatawu ma bi ma wore legi ñu ñaañu magget nañu ya ngi ras dag dag tay nañu fu nek tay nak ñu bëgg ñu ëbbat ci ñi mbot yi dara man dara ne tan nga so dund sa fu sa ba sank da bab goñ ni fatte demb nañ ko fatte way atte bu tatte ndiegam def na ci temeri milia oy ku ray sama jekk royal ma la ilaha illallah linger ramatu ci afrique lañu nek mara li metti na waye lolou tax ñu sali dé taw wat na ko ci turu aduna ak turu koroban gi ni li ngay wax duñ ko nangu dé ci ñak mo ñu gëna sango dérét nang len di xaar
minutes. It depends on control. It takes 30 seconds. Okay, so if you go to the uh, the website of California Newsreel, who are the company that release hyenas in the USA, they give a, a brief description of hyenas, which is gives some more details for the, the key court scene we've just seen. So the website says, years ago, when Jibril Diop Mambeti was living in the port district of Dakar, a beautiful prostitute would descend from high society each Friday night to treat the poor of the quarter to a lavish meal. They named her Linger, which means unique queen in Wolof, the main language in Senegal that everybody speaks in this film and Ramatu, which means the red bird of the dead in the mythology of ancient Egypt. And suddenly, one Friday, uh, this woman, this prostitute, was not there. She did not appear. And at that point, Mambeti decided to invent a history for her, to invent a fictional history. He imagined her to be the sole survivor of an outcast family that was slaughtered by a superstitious village which still lived in fear of her return. Mambetti only discovered an ending for his fiction years later when he saw Ingrid Bergman and Anthony Quinn in the film version of Friedrich Dürrenmatt's play De Besuch de Altendame, or The Visit of the Old Woman. It's a, uh, a play from 1955, which was translated into English in 1962 and was made into a Hollywood film in 1964 called The Visit. So in this reclusive Swiss master's bitter tale of a wealthy, aged prostitute's vengeance against the man who betrayed her, Mambetti recognized the fate of Linger Ramatu, and in appreciation he dedicated his African adaptation to the great Friedrich. That's how the film ends, with this dedication to the great Friedrich. So in Mambetti's version of this 1955 play and this 1964 film. Linger Ramatu was a beautiful and spirited but poor young woman from the sleepy village of Coloban, who fell in love with a young man called Draman Dramer. And when she became pregnant with his child, he denied paternity and bribed two men to say they had slept with her so he could marry a wealthy wife. Driven from the village, her, idols, her ideals shattered, Linger was forced into prostitution and has now become the richest woman in the world, as rich as the World Bank. So Hyenas depicts, as we can see in this clip, the, we see the beginnings of a gradual process by which the impoverished townspeople, they're not villagers, they're townspeople of Coloban, succumb incrementally and inevitably to the promise of wealth, the promise of 100,000 million dollars or euros or francs, the promise of wealth that is offered by Linger Ramatu, and the future of unimaginable wealth offered by Linger Ramatu in exchange for the sentence of death that is visited upon the grocer Draman Dramer is staged as the gradual victory of the sovereignty of money over morality and self-determination. So Hyenas appears to us as a fable, a fable of female retribution visited upon a former lover whose historical betrayal and perjury forces her to leave the town of Coloban that sided with patriarchy against justice. So the choice that Ramatu presents to the people of Coloban, the choice that we just saw, and the decision made by the town turns upon the town's capacity for sacrifice, the sacrifice through expulsion, which is recounted and re-narrated by Ramatu in the clip and by the chief justice who is played by Mambeti himself. So Mambeti, the director, plays the chief justice in the black. So it is the townspeople's capacity for sacrificing, for, for scapegoating Ramatu, which is ensnared by her and redirected against the grocer, against Dramer, in the name of his past injustice against her, which now blocks the path 
to a new future of wealth. So the town of Coloban exemplifies the corruption of the neo-colony. The historical gendering of the law is channeled towards the future of world capitalism that is personified in the malevolent sovereignty of Lingere Ramatu. And the universality of this narrative, according to the, the critic Cobna Mercer, resides not in the translation into an African context of a European story that is originally set in a Swiss village, but in the way Mambetti observes the human capacity for violence when shared responsibility is instead polarized onto the scapegoat within the logic of retributive justice. And this reading clearly makes a lot of sense. It's not that this reading is incorrect or mistaken. It's more the case that arriving at such an understanding of the fatality and the futurity of hyenas as a film fable entails reading for and imposing a transparency that is not in the final scene, is not on close inspection, evident or visible. So in order to do that, in order to understand um, this reading of the final scene and of this question of fatality and futurity, uh, maybe we could dim the lights once more and then we could play the second clip. Thank you. Which is, a, it's about nine minutes.
Morami, bunuh orang yang nak cila yobi, menjebel kardugi, kiri fuku mak, kiri fuku ted, kiri fuku bah, kiri fuku am kam kam, mui profesor kolaban, kolak profesor, kardugangok, buki kolaban, lingkar ramat tu pun jadi pali, am nalu mu bagi cibir kolam, lola ilan. Ligar ramatu deg le bug. Fongen le ligar ramatu bunyi jaya sangen ni urus. Dapat bug dapat dapat sunu baner. Ligar ramatu fak neni. Sun deg bi musno dapat si deg. Musno kau wah hitam. Pakai kalaban. Mak musno pe ate ate buta siakar. Nak musli pe ati fi ati say say murau. Nak ati uny fi tas katu ya kar murau. Nak wat ati uny fi or kat murau. Drama drama. Ya tak linggir ramu tu dinu devil lima nu nara devil. Nak ham gololu. Anak aku fi am lumba gelar drama drama ini tahu. Boromi, aku fi am lumba gawah. Cindi galu lino linger ramatu, digal. Kep gua kami kisah sekolah setno. Ngetau fi cion deg. Tak ada cindi geli, ia kerja salah saya tu. Konak, malam ini, cindi geli, ananci, wae, haris tak hulde, haris tak hulde, haris tak hulde, haris tak hulde, nak nyuci bo. Aksunu, hal, jumpa. Degerek ketak. Degerek ketak. Degerek ketak. Haris tahu. Degerek. Haris tahu. Haris tahu kalau masih. Degerek ketak. Degerek ketak. Degerek ketak. Degerek ketak. Haris tahu. Degerek ketak. Haris tahu. Haris tahu. Degerek ketak. Haris tahu. Aristau, tidak ada. Jangan mandi ramai. Ya sebab tu jatno. Ini sebab apa? Gubuk muzik. Siapa ni? Muslim ya. Mui. Amlo cigarette mai kosih ben. Wow, amlo cigarette sesap. Amlo jok. Mbak Kitu lo? Lui waral mi chip. Menyana lebo? Tengah nyana lewat kolaban, tebamang.
blighted landscape of the desert, outside the time of Colaban, in the desert of the political. The townsmen walk in line across the mountain's edge. In the distance stands the Chief Justice. On the promontory, the flat rock stands Lingare Ramatu. The male townsmen, the male townspeople of Colaban gather to put Draman to death, to sacrifice him. They wear black wigs, powdered faces. They gather round Draman. They repeat words, not for the money, not for the money. Their muttering increases in volume. They press around Draman. The sound of the wind increases in volume. In the distance, the ocean. They walk away, leaving a fabric. Draman's coat, which nobody touches. A bulldozer pushes red earth over the scene. The sound of an aeroplane appears. Above the horizon, the skyline of a central business district. The earth reveals the tracks of bulldozers. 
An anonymous man, a hunter, stands and stares at the fabric. The discarded remnant of Draman's jacket marks the ground as sacred, sacred in the sense that it is set apart from common use, sacred as in Saka. So on the website of the California newsreel, this, you know, this, uh, this, this site which acts as a kind of um, uh, a conventional and commonsensical reading of the film, this final scene, the scene we just saw, is described as follows. In the film's climax, the townspeople literally consume Draman, leaving only his clothes behind like hyenas. So according to this interpretation, the sentence of death visited upon the grocer, Draman Dramer, is carried out in a ritual of collective consumption, a ritual of collective cannibalism. In a conversation with the critic Joan Rodenbeck, published in October, magazine, October Journal, in summer 2010, the respected New York University-based critic, the Malian critic Mantia Durara, agrees with this reading. He says that Ramatu, quote, just sits down and waits. Rodenbeck replies, yes, she waits them out. And then Durara says, it happens slowly. She doesn't get into criticism of anybody, but look, they literally et the guy. He disappeared. And Rodenbeck agrees, et the guy. So according to this interpretation, the final scene of hyenas is a ceremony of ingestion and digestion. In a brilliant recent essay published in Eflux called Neoliberalism and the New Afro-Pessimism, Mambetti's Hyenas, the Seattle-based scriptwriter and critic Charles Mudady interprets the final scene of hyenas as a communal killing, a killing whose egalitarian ethos can be associated by ecologists and anthropologists with the formation of what could be called hunter-gatherer societies. So according to Mudady, in his interpretation of this final scene, the stark conclusion of hyenas is that the mechanism of communal killing of the egalitarian ethos has effectively been captured by neoliberalism. The mechanism of communal killing that supports the egalitarian ethos can be argued to be the mechanism by which human morality was spawned and shaped. He says, it is much, much older than democracy and much more about the animal origins of our humanity. So according to this interpretation, what we see in the final scene is a ritual of communal killing, which is nothing less than the depiction of the anthropological origin of morality in the process of being captured by neoliberalism. The final scene of hyenas then depicts the death of human morality qua morality, the death of morality as such. Draman Dramer, the grocer of Coliban, therefore, quote, dies in the poisoned pool of human morality. His death is also the death of what made us human in the first place, our morality, which was itself developed to keep tyrannical behavior in check for the survival of the community. And that's the quote by Charles Mudady. So these three interpretations by Mudady, by Mantia Diwara in conversation with Joan Rodenbeck and by this distribution company with this website, all of these reach a consensus on the final scene. It is a scene of consumption and it is a scene of cannibalism. It is a scene in which the townspeople sentence Draman and they repeat their sentence. But we could say that what they do obscures what they say. That is, their bodies obstruct the viewer, the spectator, from seeing what it is they actually do. The townspeople sacrifice the grocer in the name of what they call justice. But there is no sacrifice. There is no murder. There is no putting to death. What there is, is the presupposition of sacrifice by us. What there is, is the inference of murder, the presupposition of ingestion. 
the scene of putting to death, as we saw, is occluded. And by preventing the viewer from occupying a point of view from which to see what happens, what we do see is that justice is not seen to be done. What we see is that a ritual of sanctioned murder, if that's what it is, is mystified. What we see is a, an occluded ceremony of hidden justice. So this final scene in Hyenas can be understood not as a murder, not as a sacrifice, not as cannibalism, but more precisely as an act of occluded incorporation by a corporate personhood, a corporate body whose opacity does not thwart transparency or universality, as Edouard Glisson proposed, but instead acts as the fatal precondition for integration into the political sequence of global capitalism. In the Poetics of Relation, Edouard Glisson argued that the right to opacity thwarts the transparency of power and frustrates the right to difference that presupposes transparency. Opacity is a singularity for Glisson. It is an ontological capacity. But it is not clear, precisely clarity, it is not clear whether opacity then, in 1991, 1992, or now in 2016, operates only as a counterpower to the transparency of power. It could be said that opacity is a predicate that is capable of being mobilized on the side of power as much as it is a tactic that can be mobilized against power. Today, power reserves the right to a pasty for itself and imposes transparency upon its subjects. The final scene of hyenas could be understood as a performance of the sacrificial logic of structural adjustment programs of the 1980s and 1990s as a dramatization of the cuts demanded by the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank in return for loans, as a cinematic evocation of the rituals of murder that founded neoliberalism in Chile, in Russia, in Chile, in America, in UK, as a fable of the magical practices of market fundamentalism as an allegory of the magical thinking that flourishes in the age of market fundamentalism. So the final scene does not exactly reveal murder, nor does it reveal sacrifice, nor does it reveal ingestion. What it dramatizes is incorporation. The townsmen incorporate Draman, the grocer. They become an incorporated body and this incorporated body serves to distribute responsibility for its actions. Everybody and nobody is responsible for disincorporating Draman. At the same time, this incorporated body becomes a person with rights. The final scene of Hyenas then could be understood as performing the practice of becoming a corporation a corporation that, according to the memorandum of articles in commercial law, cannot be killed. The townsmen become immortal through an act of incorporation. And what you hear in this scene are the sinister sounds of a corporate muttering. And these voices that speak and mutter to themselves cannot be attributed to any one specific person. It is a collective aggregate vocalizing. Could this be the sound of a corporation coming into existence? Could these vocalizations be the sounds of the townsmen of Colaban taking upon themselves the role of a corporate body? What does incorporation sound like anyway? If a corporation could speak, what would it sound like? What would it say? What would it dream of? as it institutes itself through an act of self-sanctioned violence. The townsmen enclose Draman. They circle him. They surround him. They bracket him. They are a human bracket. 
The scene takes place between parentheses, between brackets. The scene is enclosed. The final scene can be seen as a parenthetical scene of incorporation. And as uh, the philosopher Gabriel Catren argued um, very helpfully uh, when I presented this pr paper in uh, the Performing Arts Forum in St. Erm, uh, he seized on this notion of bracketing and said that, you know, we can understand bracketing in a philosophical sense as a term that Edmund Husserl uses to describe um, the notion of the phenomenological epoch. The epoch is the generalized suspension of judgments by which the field of experience manifests itself in its pure phenomenological givenness. The question is, can this suspension of judgment, which is a technical question inside of philosophy, can it be speculatively extended beyond its phenomenological precondition to the cinematic suspension of Linguer Ramatou's death sentence. Now, what this implies, if we follow Catrin's line of thought, is that the accomplishment of the disincorporation or the murder of Germain Dromer, a disincorporation that we cannot help but <coughs> interpret as a murder, what this implies is that this accomplishment takes place in and through the paradox, the paradoxical form of the suspension of Ramatu's death sentence. So hyenas literally brackets the accomplishment of the sentence of death, which is to say that it is not possible to know what exactly happens in the final scene of hyenas to force a resolution of the inherent ambiguity of this final scene is to miss the point of the final scene. The inscription of this ambiguity can be understood as the only way to withdraw from the dilemma that is being proposed. Either the townspeople of Coloban accept Linger Ramatu's offer of money in exchange for the death of Draman Dromer, or they refuse her offer. If the people of Coloban accept or refuse Ramatu's offer of money, then they would already be accepting the terms of an externally imposed dilemma. And the, the three critical interpretations that I read, and which you can read everywhere in the, in the 25 years since hyenas emerged, the critical interpretations are really quite clear on this. The people of Coloban accepted Linger's Ramatu's offer and they put Draman Dromer to death. But the stubborn fact is that there is a blind spot at the scene. There is a black hole at the scene of incorporation and disincorporation. Or rather, the blind spot takes the form of an occluded incorporation. There is a topological anomaly that is inscribed at the heart of the historical process that is being launched in this final scene. So instead of seeing this scene in Charles Mudady's sense as an archaic practice which is captured by neoliberalism, could we say rather that the inscription of ambiguity at the heart of the final scene opens a zone of inherent uncertainty at the heart of the historical sequence of capitalist development that is being instituted in this scene, which is to say, Draman Dromer is Schrodinger's cat. And as Schrodinger's cat, he is neither dead nor alive. And it is this uncertainty diagonalizes the binary dilemma imposed by Linger Ramatu. That is to say, it is this uncertainty that draws a diagonal between the dilemma of accepting or refusing the offer imposed by Linger Ramatu. 
the forthcoming historical sequence is inherently ungrounded by the accomplishment of the sentence in the form of a suspended bracketing, which is why I liked John McKell's presentation. He accomplished the sentence imposed upon him by suspending it. Nobody knows how or when the hidden potentialities of this zone of uncertainty will explode or unfold. What we do know is Draman's rumpled coat and the wind and the blasted ground. Where does Draman's body go to? Does it become music? This performance of corporate incorporation produces a disincorporation whose cause and whose effect remains opaque. It forecasts a future in which incorporation cloaks its causes and shields its effects. What can be seen in the final scene of Hyenas is the enactment of a shell. The townsmen form themselves into a shell corporation, a corporation without active business operations or significant assets, a corporation that disguises or deflects business ownership from law enforcement or the public. The townspeople enact the collective figure of a shell corporation that exists as an account, that counts itself as an account of no account, that counts itself as a legally incorporated empty personhood, a shell corporation embedded in the desert of the political, in an extraterritorial jurisdiction. In the, desert, in the distant horizon can be seen a shining city. And this magical urbanism, as the urban geographer Mike Davis calls it, emerges all at once in a scene of accelerated development. At the very end of the film, we suddenly see the shining city. We hear the drum machines that beat out a defiant and desolate synthetic tattoo that mixes into the roar of an aeroplane that travels across the stereo field. A bulldozer reverses. At the edge of the horizon, beyond the scored mud and the single baobab tree, an aeroplane lands. Africa is rising. Africa has risen. The parenthetical disincorporation of Draman Dramer is the prerequisite and precondition for a projected future in which Africa is rising throughout the first decade of the 21st century. A central business district has appeared on the horizon, a horizon that envisages an era in which Africa will rise. At a time in 1992 when the dismal science of development economics forecast a continental failure. In December, 20, in December 3rd, 2011, The Economist magazine announces on its front cover that Africa is rising the hopeful continent. The, econom the economist declares that, quote, after decades of slow growth, Africa has a real chance to follow in the footsteps of Asia. Over the past decade, six of the world's 10 fastest growing countries were African. In eight of the past 10 years, Africa has grown faster than East Asia, including Japan even allowing from the, for the knock-on effect of the Northern Hemisphere's slowdown, the International Monetary Fund expects Africa to grow by 6% this year and nearly 6% in 2012, about the same as Asia. So the IMF expects Africa to grow by 6% in 2011 and nearly 6% in 2012. And this future that is forecast by the economist that was forecast by the economist is followed by the forecast of time magazine in 2012 whose front cover read africa rising in october 2013 the harvard business review front cover reads africa's time is now so from 1992 hyenas looks forward to the horizon of expectation announced in 2011, 2012, and 2013, 
a horizon of expectation for the economic future of the continent. And what the final scene of hyenas envisions is the fatal precondition for the acceleration of economic development. It is a, it is a futurism that imagines the ethical and political costs of the continental futures forecast by a development complex that operates inside and outside the continent. In 2016, the forecast as a chrono-political practice can be distinguished from and contrasted with the chrono-political practice of prediction. According to Elena Esposito, in her recent essay, Blindness, her recent lecture rather, Blindness and Power in Algorithmic Prediction, the forecast and the prediction each presuppose different operations and each create different futures. Esposito asks the following question. How do we face the future? We limited human beings with limited access to data and limited ability to process data. We face the future only at best with forecasts, which can be more or less precise, but which are always affected by our unavoidable uncertainty. We can do this using statistical procedures, using probability calculus and sampling, and generalizing from a sample which is an inevitably limited part of a statistical universe. We make aggregate forecasts on a macroscopic level, starting from a sample at a lower level. That's how we predict how the economy will fare, how a political party will fare on the next election. So that's how The Economist and Time magazine and Harvard Business Review come up with their forecasts. But Esposito says that big data does not have this limitation. Algorithms can access all data about a phenomenon. They can access an entire statistical universe. They do not need sampling. They do not need statistical procedures. That's why they make predictions, not forecasts. They can process the universe. They can process all data about this universe. And in this universe, they look for patterns that the computer can abstract from this so-called ocean of data. And that is something that is completely new in our world. So Esposito distinguishes between two kinds of futures, the present future and the future present. Algorithms predict the present future based on total statistical patterns. Statistical samples, on the other hand, provide the basis for forecasts that generate what she calls future presence. The present future of algorithmic prediction is characterized by the forward projection of today's uncertainty. By contrast, the future present of the forecast is an open future that produces a present that is different from today. The future that hyenas anticipates is the future present of the statistical forecast of 2011, 2012, and 2013. Hyenas forecasts the models and graphs and horizons that Time Magazine, The Economist, and the Harvard Business Review use to forecast their futures. The anticipatory power of dramatization of the final scene of hyenas then seems to reach its limit when we reach the present future of algorithmic prediction. The computational powers of pattern and correlation surely dwarf the computational limitations of the economic forecast. But Elena Esposito adds one more critical factor. The present future of algorithmic prediction can be described as blind because the present future cannot include itself. Algorithms cannot predict futures that take account of their own predictions. 
And this blindness is a limit that is internal to and constitutive of big data. There is a blind spot at the scene of incorporation. There is a blind spot at the scene of disincorporation in hyenas. Does the blind spot in hyenas unground the forthcoming historical process of algorithmic prediction whose statistical blindness is operative now? Does the inherent uncertainty of the fate of Germain Dramer anticipate the uncertainty at the heart of algorithmic prediction? Thank you. Of course, I have no sense of time whatsoever, so I don't know how much time we have left for thoughts or questions or comments or just responses of any kind. But I'll be happy to respond to anything anybody has to say. solo están hasta las 2 de la tarde entonces lo que vamos a hacer es pasar directamente a la presentación de Silvia y Graham y concentrar las preguntas eh, a Cot, yo y a Silvia juntas y podemos un poco improvisar con la traducción So what I'm saying is that the translators are just staying until 2 So what we are going to do is now go directly into the into Silvia's and Graham's presentation and then Yes, yes, with a little pause. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, definitely. Yes, so how... Yes. Yes. So how can we do? Because is this problem... Yeah. Okay. Okay, so. Okay. And then we are going to let um, uh, cinema speak in our place. Mm -hmm. And yeah. we don't need the, the collaboration of the translation. Okay, so but then. Good. But okay, so we then. Okay. Great. 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 Okay, thank you, Silvia. I don't know if. No sé si si alguien tiene ya preparada una una pregunta porque a mí me va a costar. Hay bastantes. Oh well, thanks. Well, wow, that was really amazing. Um, as a uh, an analysis of 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 this film and of this sequence. Um, I think, uh, but there's a thing when I was watching the sequence, um, from what your the um, critiques that you were talking about, who had like in a sense given this, I must say that it never entered my mind that this scene was about cannibalism or in, in a sense that the what transpired for me was the question of what God I would say sur le cinéma, which is the fact that. The last scene, it's, it's, it's a scene also of disappearance in a way. And so this question of, yeah, the Schrod Schrodinger's cat and the, the inherent sort of um, put placing in suspension. But then there's also another really interesting thing which happens in the switch between the, the, the long shot and the short um, and the, and the close-up, which is that from a long shot, it looks like some kind of pull that they are gradually drifting away from. I, I couldn't figure out what it was. This, you, know, you can call this like blind spot, but I mean, it has this kind of 
transformational um, form and force this this point of the screen that becomes several different things as you're watching it. You're, you're trying to work out what it is finally as as it reveals this this point. And one of the things that we can say is is like magic. I mean, it's something like magic in a way that returns to the very early relation between cinema and magic at its very beginning. The story of just of disappearances, the, the way that cinema ima imagines disappearances, that people can just disappear like that into wherever. And so I would say that the fate of this character is also a certain agency simply of him as a, as a cinema, as a character of pure cinema, which is, you know, this, this ability to suddenly just do a vanishing act, um, which maybe, I don't know, is, is in, I mean, it's just another side of the thing which in a sense in, avoids the question of incorporation, that there is an element which isn't fin fundamentally neither, it's not incorporated and it's not disincorporated by the, the group, by the community, but it, it is a, dis, a disappearance or a disincorporation um, whose actual um, agent can't be located. It, 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 it's actual. It's the disappearance of of its own agency, as it were. As it were. In it, it, it's the the predicate of dis the predicate of disappearance without the subject of disappearance. It's a predicate separated from its subject. Yeah, that makes total sense. Um, yeah, no, it's a the. Um, the return to um, that cinema as a as a disappearing act, that moment when in which cinema and magic, cine magic, the indivisibility of that moment. I mean, it, I had an earlier version in which I said, you know, he he disappears between shots. That the shot you would expect to see him in some way receive his sentence is in a way replaced by the ocean, that sudden shot to the sea. Um, but yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. This question of disappearance is, is, is uh, critical. In fact, your reading is actually very close to Mambetti's own reading. Which he says something quite similar. Mm -hmm. So um, it was very important not to resolve that reading. And, um, and so what's striking is how how the critical reading resolves that question of disappearance, which I call disincorporation. Um, the way it settles for all these understandings. I mean, there are many more. I collected as many as I could. Because over 25 years, films accumulate and sediment, you know, a kind of corpus of, a kind of corpus of misunderstandings you know, a sum total of readings in which the visible is not the same as the image and is not the same as the evidentiary. All of these things are conflated when actually the key is to distinguish them all. So the, the question of disappearance is a question of belief, right? It's a question of not being able to believe your own eyes. This is the question of magic. You know, magic is the is the disarticulation of the image from belief, the, the, the kinds of um, the tricks of causation that magic plays on you. So, you know, you see, you know, the kinds of um, magic is, uh, one way of understanding magic is as a kind of, um, it's a kind of popular, popular neurology. The magician plays tricks with attention and expectation and misdirection and causation. Uh, the musician, the magician fictionalizes cause and effect and they fictionalize belief and they fictionalize attention. They, they, they play with it as a material and clearly certain kinds of cinema uh, have done the same thing and um, Mambetti's uh, brilliance in this scene is to is to in a way draw on those powers yeah.
from the algorithmic futures because in a sense he's drawing on powers which although the film is projected towards this kind of horizon which is also a fata morgana also the question of the oh yes the horizon good, of the of yeah the, that's of a good the, way the of thinking about city. it but the the cinema r returns to it, if you like a kind of a locus of its own power um which is in a sense running in another direction from this kind of question of algorithm, which is based on being able finally to see things, to, 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 to actually, for, for data to be completely visible to it, but, which is finally to say that cinema is not data. <laughs> there, there is something, that, you know, it's like something which resists dataization. Yeah. And that binary, you know, did they, didn't they thing, mm. which would, you know, be yeah. part of its stupidity, basically. Yeah. Thank you. Eh, gracias por eh, la excelente intervención que has hecho. Quería eh, relacionar una cuestión que planteaste ayer en el taller. Decía que gracias por la excelente conferencia que has hecho y quería traer una cuestión que planteaste ayer, ayer en el taller que creo que es interesante ponerla sobre la mesa, que es la cuestión de la opacidad. Eh, la cuestión de la opacidad porque todo lo que has planteado tiene que ver con la cuestión de la, de la transparencia como problema en los sistemas de gobierno y en las democracias y en... Y en los, en los sistemas que intentan ser transparentes. Y la película creo que plantea la posibilidad de el punto ciego o de la opacidad como un problema para la colectividad o como una posibilidad también para la colectividad. Entonces sería interesante que te apuntases un poco más en esta dirección, ¿no? De la opacidad como una posibilidad colectiva o para la colectividad. Well, um, so Glisson's uh, Poetics of Relation is translated into English around 91, but it's, uh, it's a series of essays that he writes in the 80s. And uh, Glisson, when you look through his, his writings from his 60s, his first book of poetic theory called Poetic Intentionality, which is at the end of the 60s, he's continually changing and adapting his notion of opacity. Um, and by the 80s, um, opacity is this, um, uh, it's this question of singularity, uh, which evades um, the demand for transparency, the demand for enlightenment, um, the demand for um, clarity um, and also moves against the right to difference and uh, you know there's a kind of um, there's a there's a strange the fact that they emerged around the same time right, 91, 92 um, suggests that uh, we could say that both Glisson and uh, Mambetti in their very different ways was searching for a way to to formulate a, a more complex notion of um, subjectivity that is not tied to agency and um, a predicate, a capacity, which is not necessarily tied to a subjectivity or an agency. I think a pasty, in Glisson's term, had a poetic and an ontological and a political capacity, which in the present becomes fascinating for us in the sense of it becomes understood as a tactic, as a kind of tactical media operation, becomes understandable as a kind of queer tactic, um, and which clearly um, resonates in a world of surveillance, um, Surveillance operates on that double level. On one hand, surveillance is is transparency as such. On the other hand, surveillance is not operating on the level of the visible at all. Surveillance is operating on the level of data, which has nothing to do with visibility as such. 
Um, but the, the work of Zach Blass, he really takes this notion of informatic opacity and works with it in a compelling way. What he shows is that in, under conditions of biometric surveillance, um, what you see is the, is the fact that um, many African and African Caribbean skin tones actually are not recognized by surveillance. The, the actual databases that, drew, that, that surveillance draws on um, tend to recognize only white skins. So that there's a certain sense in which um, African Americans already escape surveillance, but this escaping from surveillance exposes them to a further disciplining, precisely because the fact that they escape surveillance, the fact that they are opaque, is what gets them tagged as a potential threat. So that the opacity is not, the opacity that allows them to escape from surveillance is not an opacity that is directed by them. It's an external opacity. It's as if transparency imposes an opacity upon them that they themselves do not want. In other words, maybe many African Americans would rather be recognized and be able to go through be able to go through a biometric data system. They don't want to escape it and then be tagged as a possible potential threat. In other words, under certain conditions, a pasty is not only a tactic. A pasty is a kind of is a kind of enforced impos enforced imposition under conditions of surveillance, which means that under certain conditions. Um, African Americans would like to have the capacity to be transparent. So, in other words, it's the notion of a tactical idea of a pasty doesn't mean that a pasty has an inherently progressive dimension to it. A pasty seems to be uh, utilized and operationalized by power and against power, and in a way, um, the, the the kind of the recent the kind of uh, the excitement around um, a pasty cloaking camouflaging disappearing that that entire set of practices um, needs to be more specified because because there are anomalies which have to be taken into account so it's only it's only if you assume that we are all transparent under the eye of power, that a pasty seems to be something like this counterpower. But if you take into account this question of what African, how African American skin tones are understood, then it's not that simple. Um, so we need, I'd say we need a more nuanced notion of how a pasty functions. We need a kind of something like a a political calculus of a pasty, you know, something like a political economy of a pasty, which doesn't simply assume its virtue or its insurrectionary or its, uh, um, you know, doesn't necessarily assume its insurrectionary capacity, because I don't think it has that in and of itself. And in a way, Glisson, Glisson's notion was more modest than that. It's just in the 25 years since that, um, a, a kind of, in, a kind of in theoretical inflation has taken place, which Glisson himself encouraged. By the time of 2007, in his last book, Glisson was again talking about a pasty in a much larger sense. So in a way, he himself expanded it, and then in a way gave permission to other people to, to in a way, take the term and put it to work. So, um, so I think uh, I think it's really complex, and it depends on a kind of understanding of an economy, both of surveillance and of what um, what has been called surveillance. You know, both sur surveillance S U R and surveillance as in S O U S. We need a political economy of both of those, and their entanglement. Thank you.
Eh, solamente un comentario. Eh, muchas gracias, Cocho, también por, por la conferencia. Eh, en relación a esta, para continuar con, con esta cuestión de la opacidad eh, y hacer una referencia con el comienzo de tu charla, eh, en la que hablabas de la problemática de, de que dentro del continente africano hay muchos eh, críticos, incluso, bueno, no sé si filmmakers o artistas, o bueno, hay una, una, una sensación en la, en la de cierto rechazo de ese concepto de afrofuturismo y de incluso de igual de, de algunos referentes y de, yeah. y de algunas películas, ¿no? Y, y, y en ese sentido, eh, eh, y, y en relación a la idea de la opacidad y del versus visibilidad, eh, me parecía interesante ver qué es lo que se puede hacer, ¿no? O sea, si realmente esa tendencia a, a, a no querer ver eh, tiene también algo de, 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 de posibilidad ¿no? en sí misma. O sea, si también es un, un rechazo por eh, encontrar otros referentes y de esa manera, eh, o sea, cual, si, si realmente, o sea, también con, con esta película en concreto, ¿no? Que, eh, que nos lleva otra vez como a la, a la, a la cuestión eh, de la problemática de de repente ser muy visible ¿no? y, y con el final eh, nos dejan suspensos o sea, no, eh, es decir me estoy, me estoy un poco liando ¿no? pero eh, qué es lo que sucede cuando eh, cuando vemos esta película y de repente la película se convierte en un referente que podemos todos compartir no y sin embargo, el final de la, de, de, de la película eh, no nos resuelve eh, una, un, la narrativa, no nos resuelve el sentido. ¿no? Eh, entonces, bueno, me parecía interesante el, la cuestión de la opacidad frente a, 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 esa, a esa problemática que planteabas al principio, ¿no? de ese rechazo de, de, de ver imágenes, por un lado. ¿no? De, de, no sé si, si tiene sentido un poco lo que... Yeah. Yeah. Um, so in a way, um, most of the most of the critical discourse around hyenas is a discourse of disambiguation. The idea is to disambiguate, disambiguate the the uncertainty of what occurs. Um, However it's interpreted, it's necessary to, to come to uh, an understanding that in a way reconstructs a causation that is not actually evidentiary. So the part of the project is to, first of all, uh, insist on an ambiguity, but then second of all, um, my initial statement was designed to say that um, the, the search for continental futures, which is just the shorthand term I use, um, in a way overlooks the fact that there are already futuristic films. So when Hyenas appeared, it was understood not as um, a film of continental futurism, nor even as a film of Afrofuturism, but as a film of Afro-pessimism. So there is another version of this talk in which I describe three different discourses of Afro-pessimism that are operational. The first discourse in the 1980s was a, a developmental discourse of American journalism, which forecasts a kind of future of doom and gloom for the African continent, a continent of war and famine and genocide and disease. This is the this is the the notion of Afro pessimism that these that the terrible future of the African continent is inherent to the people and conditions. In other words, it's African people's fault that the African that the future of the continent is so bleak. This was crudely speaking what Afro pessimism in its first incarnation was, and it was very much formulated in American conservative magazines such as the Atlantic Monthly. So that's Afro pessimism one. Afro pessimism two is a discourse that emerges around um, 2000, um, and this this is um, based more around the idea that 
there is a cinema and literature of self-critique and disenchantment which examines the fact that the that the the problems of uh, m many countries are uh, at least as much to do with the problems of the one-party state and of self-rule. So this is a cinema of, uh, it's a kind of existential cinema of disillusion, disillusionment and disenchantment after the end of Pan-Africanism, after the end of independence. So it's a kind of confrontation with the, with the failures of the state it's a confrontation with the failures of ideology. It's a confrontation with the costs of ideology and the costs of independence. Uh, and uh, the, what happened with hyenas was that um, hyenas was interpreted as an example both of the first kind of Afro-pessimism and of the second. So it was critiqued for being Afro-pessimistic in the first sense for saying that, the, crudely speaking, the, the, the fault of the problem with uh, the continent is the problem with its people. But it was celebrated for being a cinema of disenchantment and a cinema of disaffection and a cinema without consolation, a cinema that condemns without consolation. So it was both critiqued and celebrated and these are two forms of Afro-pessimism in the 80s and in the 90s. And then there is a third recent notion of Afro-pessimism which emerges in America, which is a, uh, uh, a discourse which is largely philosophical, based around the writings of uh, literary theorists and philosophers such as uh, Horten Spillers, uh, the, the African-American feminist theorist, Orlando Patterson, the Jamaican sociologist, Frank B. Wilderson III, um, American theorist, and they effectively and rapidly argued that um, slavery never ended, emancipation was never completed, and that the afterlives of slavery continue into the present, so that the conditions of racialized capitalism have merely evolved, and that the questions of independence is the form that slavery now takes. So under those conditions, um, they argue for a third notion of Afro-pessimism. So part of my argument was that um, Afro-pessimism is an Afro-futurism. So in the 1980s, Stuart Hall would argue that race is the modality in which class is lived. So class, class is experienced through race. Race is the modality in which class is lived. So in this other version of the paper, the argument is that pessimism is the modality in which the future is lived. Uh, and part of the argument is to argue that these three modes of Afro-pessimism can be re-articulated as three kinds of Afrofuturism. Uh, and that um, in order to do that, in a way that the kinds of futurisms being argued in the continent now need to face two ways. They both need to invent new futurisms, of course, but they also have to do this work of disarticulating works that are already futuristic but are somehow locked in previous discourses. So you have to return to previous films, previous books, previous, uh, previous novels, previous theories, which are in a way locked, locked by, by their admirers and their critics. Uh, and you'd have to return and do a work of disarticulation. So th this project is a, it's a project of disarticulation. So I return to these moments where there is a work which is celebrated and critiqued on, s on a certain discourse. And the idea is to, is to undo that discursive celebration and discursive critique and then say, what if this is... What if this is a futurism, but a futurism that was understood differently then? And how can we understand it now? So then you get the paradox that even before Afrofuturism, 
in its American-centered phase was formulated, we already had continental futurisms. So Hyenas is 91, 92, that's before Last Angel of History, it's before Mark Derry formulates the notion of what Afrofuturism is. So there is already a continental futurism. It's just that it's misnamed and its, it's, its discursive constitution is blocked and contained. So uh, it's a double project. And, and, um, and so the, 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 in a way the, uh, the critique coming from critics and artists, especially in Cape Town and Johannesburg, the critique is a good one, but in a way, in a way, there's a, there's a kind of under underneath the critique is a kind of desire to join the kind of uh, to join. A, there's a kind of a sense of a, there's a it's unfair, but there's a desire to join Afrofuturism and to say you know, to say on one hand, I don't want to belong to it. On the other hand, I want to widen it enough so that I can join it. And that's because Afrofuturism, to use John O'Conver's term, has a, kind of, has a kind of brand economy to it. It sounds seductive. It sounds appealing. It's self-congratulatory. Of course, who would refuse the idea of being an, a futurist? It's, it's very appealing. Um, so in a way, it's, a, it's an internal battle which is taking place, but it's a battle over the directions of culture. And Afrofuturism is a kind of a way to condense those questions. Um, and um, if, you're, if you're aged between 18 and 25, then there is a lot of energy to create new forms of futurism, new speculations, which is clearly to be uh, affirmed, but simultaneously this work of disarticulation should happen in parallel with that, not instead of. So um, in a way I do the second uh, in, in the solidarity with the first, but I'm not so interested in a kind of, um, um, a kind of, um, sometimes there's a weird kind of ressentiment like a kind of resentment against Afrofuturism in the 90s, as if to say, oh, you Americans and you diasporic Brits, you were busy having a good time in the 90s and you didn't take any notice of us. Now it's our turn. We're going to show you. There's a bit of that as well. And you think, yes, but the point is not to join an expanding club. The point is to, is to work on several fronts at once. I mean, the question of a pasty is is part of that, but a pasty is kind of one. A pasty is one. Uh, it's one of these master words. It's one of these master concepts that draws a lot of critical energy and a lot of artistic energy towards it, because it seems to offer a, a mode of navigation that 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 speaks to a desire for secession, and speaks for a desire to move to move through, uh, to move in and through and by way of occlusion and, uh, and away from a kind of enforced visibility, an enforced participation, an enforced um, sense of belonging. And it speaks to a desire for disidentification.